I'm Rob Schilling, Chair of the Washington Road Community Trail. Welcome to the WRC Speaker Series. Throughout the year, we will host events to feature speakers covering a variety of topics. They'll range from environmental concerns, photography, gardening techniques, and more. These events are informational, fun, and free. So bring your family and friends. Go to our website at www.wrctrail.org to check out upcoming schedule of events that you won't want to miss. All right, so my name is Marian Ware, and I'm the executive director of the Community Media Center. And if you don't know, I see a lot of new faces, which I'm very, very pleased about. The Community Media Center is a nonprofit, but it's also associated with the county and a contract that allows you to get local television here in Carroll County. So there's five channels, actually. Uh, some of them are your Board of Ed, some of them the government channel where you see the commissioners a lot. And this channel, 19, is your channel. So this is the public access channel. And we do a lot of things to basically educate and inform people in the community. And our mission is to use this to do what you think is important and to get your voice out to the community. So we would love for you to come to an orientation, find out uh, other things that we do, other ways you can be involved, but obviously you're very interested in photography, so we'll start there with the trail. I assume that you also are people that uh, want to be involved in terms of the land, the environment, and we've just started a speaker series and some programs that we hope we can develop that. The uh, trail is all self-supported in the sense that it's a volunteer effort. So I'm going to tell you April 11th is cleanup day. So if you don't know a lot about the trail, please come back on April 11th at least and help us uh, make it nicer for everyone there. Also, Steve Alders here. Steve, you want to raise your hand? And Steve is involved with lots of programs that I'm sure you'll be interested in, including one in uh, April, I think, which I'm is... I'm going to have to scratch my head, but I believe it is tick -tock. April. TikTok. Yep, we're going to be talking about um, deer tick primarily and yeah. deer tick prevention and some of the right. strategies right. In your own, on your own property, but also when you go outside, such as right. on the trail cleanup day, because they right. actually will be out. Right. So, so. and then we're trying to do a talk with him in March around pruning trees. So if you never know when to prune, like I do not, or how to prune, or, how to prune, or have done some bad pruning, uh, Steve will be back to do to help you do that. So these are all very interactive, informal. Please tell other people about us because we do, as a nonprofit, we need to upgrade our facility, actually. We're still using equipment from 15 years ago, so that's a big effort for us. Uh, so any way you can get involved and tell other people, the more successful we'll be here to serve you. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Walt. And Walt Callahan, if you don't know him or you haven't taken uh, one of these workshops, he, uh, he teaches at Stevenson, he teaches at McDaniel, he teaches a lot, he's a great teacher, uh, and he does a lot of hands-on and individual attention, which I love. Uh, I could not go through all the things that he has done, or the reason he is so good in terms of the photography, but it is an absolute passion for him. So uh, I think his bio is on the website, but I'll just start, and I'm not gonna read all this. Uh, Walt Callahan's photographic career has taken him from the Atlantic Ocean aboard a US Navy Trident submarine down lava tube caves in Idaho into surgical clinics for Afghan refugees in Peshawar, Pakistan. I'm gonna stop there, but it goes on and on. So he's had a lot of experience and he has a lot of skills and everything from kind of more traditional photography to uh, what I'm interested in, and I'm sure a lot of the young people are now interested in, which are the phone and the iPad. So stay tuned, we're gonna do more with Walt, and uh, I'm gonna join you for a while and do my own little photo clips, and then I'm gonna come back and pay bills. <laughs> so uh, we'll reach out to you, make sure we have your emails so you'll know what's happening and when. Thank you very much, and any questions, just give me a call. Well, welcome, thank you. It's so wonderful to see so many enthusiasts 
who are both using the trail, but also who have the love for photography and want to improve their photography. I, I, I just, I'm a perpetual photo student. I'm constantly working at improving my own photography. As much as I've done, I know I can learn some more. So by teaching, you guys become my instructors. I'll, you, from your questions, which I'm eagerly wanting to hear, you may say something I've never heard before. And then I have to come up with a solution, and that's the way I learn. So the key here is whether you're shooting with a cell phone or a modern DSLR, they're no different. They're identical. All cameras work on the same fundamental principles. We just have to learn how to do those fundamentals intuitively. So there's less fumbling. They're like, oh my goodness, I'm in some grand palace in Europe and the tour group is going to walk through this very quickly. We don't have 40 minutes to set up your perfect picture. You need to be able to do it intuitively. So that said, we reach down. Uh, here in Carroll County, Carroll Community College has wonderful photo programs, many different instructors, and I can't emphasize enough going to various instructors. Every one of us has a different skill set, a different teaching style. So the more variety you can get, the better you'll be. So there's things such as um, just operating your digital camera if you're a very beginner. If you're only going to shoot with what we call point and shoots, we have a class on that. Crafting your photo, crafting fo your fo photograph is the prerequisite for all advanced classes. Highly recommend it. Wonderful class. I usually teach what's called applied photography, which is more advanced. We take what you learn in crafting and build upon it. But that said, this April, I'll be teaching a class strictly on cell phone photography, if you're interested in that. And there are other, other uh, more advanced uh, DSLR features, travel photography, so that you prepare yourself uh, uh, photography as a business. You may be asked to do photography and you want to know how to do it as correctly as a business if you're doing a wedding or a family portrait or whatever. So Carol is, is a great resource. So. so I'd love to hear from you. What do you think of for winter photography? What, if you're going to come out here on the trail, what do you feel like you need to know before you step onto the trail? We take a lot from the car. Oh boy! Oh boy! Well, the, the tr tr uh, that that makes it difficult to be out on the trail. Right, right. Well, that said, be prepared. You know, it's what we learn in the Girl Scouts, what we learn in the Boy Scouts. You know, my black jeans—they're fleece lined. I'm trying to make sure I'm warm. You know, the hardest problem with photography is frozen fingers because we need the dexterity of our fingertips to operate all the buttons. You can't wear big heavy gloves. So therefore, what I'm wearing. And that said, these gloves are special. They have a special coating on all the tips of the fingers so that I can operate a screen on a, on a tablet such as an iPad, iPhone, Android. So even the high-tech gloves now you have to think about. Coating, what, is, what, what do you mean? There's a special coating inside this uh -huh. that allows me to swipe the screen. Oh. You wear traditional gloves and you try to swipe the screen, nothing will happen. Right, it's like a stylus. In this right, thing. so your yeah. stylus is in your fingertips of oh, the gloves. Right, right. Perfect for winter photography. Sure. And then, of course, layers. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it may, the sun may come out and shoot up 20 degrees, even on a winter day. You want to be in layers. Correct sh footwear, so if you do step into an icy puddle, your feet don't get wet and cold. So just, you know, common sense things for winter photography is a good starting point. The other thing you need for winter photography, extra batteries. Extra batteries. 
I can't tell you how much I believe in extra batteries. When I, I love working with basic point shoot cameras. I own them, but I carry two spare batteries. And in winter, I would take them out and put them inside my jacket where it's the warmest. And if, if that's not, if it's a really arctic cold day, and of course I should have been more prepared. Where are they? Well, in there somewhere are hand warmers. <laughs> go to, go to uh, your local hunting or camp, uh, camping store, go to REI, and you get the chemical hand warmers. Put a pack right next to your batteries. In winter, we do not want to have the camera inside our jackets. We want them outside acclimated to the cold. The moisture coming off your body, if it's inside your jacket, will get inside the camera, will get on the optics, and the moment you pull it out into this a frosty day, instant frost. Not good. So we have this dilemma of having to keep the camera outside in the cold with a battery draining. So that's why we need spare batteries. Yes, so we need to, we'll need to move along now and, and get out on the trail, but I just wanted you to do this introduction before we actually do the photography. There's a lot of uh, production work ahead of time in winter to be prepared, okay? One of the wonderful features of the Washington uh, Road Trail are the nature boxes. And in spring, summer, really good for bird photography, natural attraction. Uh, I understand in the cleanup, they'll be working on uh, if any of the boxes need restoration or they need cleaning out. This is also a nice winter habitat for field mice. So we wanna get these boxes prepared before the birds return. So we want to do that. The other thing uh, is that uh, we are now part of social media. While on the Washington Road Trail, we are now part of Instagram. We are, ha we can hashtag, they, uh, this trail has its own Instagram photo gallery. And so if you shoot out here using uh, an uh, iPhone or even some of the new modern cameras are coming with Wi-Fi. You could upload to Instagram, hash, hashtag it, uh, uh, Washington Road Trail. So WR Trail, is it? WRC Trail. WRC Trail. Hashtag, hashtag it, and the administrator of that trail, of this trail, will see your picture. And you can, you know, put an amber sam, you know, and, and then that administrator could link it to their site and they'll be uploading photos. So you'll end up being part of the greater community by sharing your own photos. And you'll get the feedback from your person because they can look at your pictures on the Instagram and like it. So please take advantage of that. So what to do photographically to prepare for winter? One of the things you want to do is mentally prepare yourself for what you exactly want to shoot out on the trail. In the cold, it is not wise to carry a lot of different lenses. You don't want to be t putting your camera lens on and off out here. You you're going to get elements inside. So you want, you, you want to just stick with a very simple setup. You don't want to lug a lot of weight shouldn't have like multiple camera bodies, but if you really feel like you need two lenses, it really is wise to have a different camera body for each so that you're in the cold, not taking this lens on and off. The other thing, if any uh, weather is happening, a simple bandana, a cotton bandana to clean things off while out here. The other thing you could do is not advocating a certain brand, 
but if, if in the winter we do get snow, we do get ice and freezing rain and whatnot, they make protective, soft protective housings for our equipment. You see, so I could simply slip, take the lens hood off so it makes it a little easier, this inside this housing, line everything up, it has a lot of elastic inside so that the lens And so now, it has a port, has a, I, uh, I, there's a, I, uh, a viewfinder port that will go on here, and you have this clear panel so that you can see your LCD screen. And then, you bring your lens through, and it also has a port in here, so if you want to access your lens, you can get access through here so that you can operate this in a, in a protected environment. If you love to do macro photography, macro photography uh, requires, usually requires, even on a day like today, supplemental flash. They make protective devices for your flash so it too will not get wet and so it's cut in a certain way to accommodate the unique angle of electronic flash. So it's totally clear so the flash comes out, but it doesn't get snowed on or rained on. Again, be prepared. So what I find in winter photography, which makes it a challenge, is the absence of color. Winter is the dead season. It's the time in preparation for the explosion of color and life in the spring. Nature's taking a rest. And therefore, the color is drab. So what I would like you to suggest in winter photography, when you are framing your images, is not to think in color. When I'm photographing in summer or spring, I'm thinking about the, the contrast between reds and greens and blues and the, the mix of contrast of colors you can get inside your viewfinder. Out here, I tend to think in black and white, in geometry, in lines. The lines of the trees, the abstractions of the branches. We don't photograph objects, we photograph the light coming off of the object. So on an overcast kind of hazy day like today, this is when we start thinking about the geometry of our scenes. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions as far as what we've done so far? So if, if you were out here right now in the winter, and you saw something out over here on the snow field, some interesting pattern, you have a huge problem. What is that problem? It's the whiteness of the snow throwing off our light meter. That's one of the hardest things to do is to get an accurate exposure in winter when there's a lot of snow and ice. Why is that? Well, the reason is our light meters work on this principle of gray tones. And so I like to carry this tiny little gray card with me, uh, particularly out on a snowy day. Oops, I gotta get this piece of paper off. There we go. This little gray card, you'll notice that it's grayer than my skin tone. So our skin tone's not an accurate way to make an accurate light reading. But having one of these allows me to take a light meter reading off of it. If it's in the same light as my snow, I could take a light meter reading off of this card, lock that exposure with my, and all cameras have exposure locks. Each, each manufacturer can, and it may not say exposure lock, it might have a star or something like that, but consult your owner's manual. This 
at simply taking a light meter reading off of a gray card and simply pressing that button, now I can aim at that snow and I'll have an accurate exposure. The other solution is to meter the snow area, then meter your gray card. When you calculate the dis difference, say it's a 1F stop, it might be greater, it might be 2F stops, we can press our exposure compensation button. On the Canons, it's a button that says AV plus minus. On the Nikons, it is simply a button that says plus minus. You press that in, and with the dial, we can dial in a plus one. If, if the exposure is one f-stop difference and the snow is brighter, we want our pictures to be overexposed. We want the snow to be overexposed, so we put in a plus one to compensate. And then you could shoot and shoot and shoot in the snow, and it's always going to give you a very nice, accurate exposure reading. Basically, we're fooling the light meter to think that the snow is 18% gray. Because our, our camera is not a very bright instrument. It's a computer, and we know by computers, garbage in, garbage out. So if we can put intelligent information into our computer, we will get very nicely crafted photographs. Okay, so let's take a break here. We'll wander down a little bit more. Yes, sir. ISO for a day like today. Great question. So the question is, what sort of ISO should I use? And ISO simply means International Standards Organization. If I were to build a building out here with a steel frame, that steel comes with an ISO number. Steel manufactured in Singapore under a certain ISO number is identical to steel of that ISO number made in Pittsburgh. It's a universal standard. So a 100 ISO on a Canon camera is identical to 100 ISO of a Nikon or a Panasonic or a Sony. That's all that ISO means. <laughs> the smaller the number, the higher your quality. So we, we want to start with our native ISO of our camera, whatever it happens to be. Some cameras might be 80, some cameras 50, some cameras 100. This particular Nikon, its lowest ISO is 200. So we want to start with that as our foundation because it's going to give us some maximum quality. Now that's only in like manual. No. You can actually change the ISO even if you're in like program? Absolutely. The, the, the only place on a camera where you cannot change the ISO is when you're on fully automatic, the little green square. When you're on green square, you have no control over your ISO, your shutter speed, your aperture. The camera, the engineers who manufacture the camera are literally grabbed your camera from you and forced you to use a particular setting. The moment you switch from full automatic to program, you can change your ISO. So we start with the lowest number, but if the area scene is dark, say we hit, this is very bright, so I would use my lowest ISO out here. Even in a cloudy day, I would use my lowest ISO number. But the moment we get towards twilight, when the sun is getting low, that's when you start needing to raise your number. And the rule of thumb, why you, what, when should you raise your number, is simply when your shutter speed goes below a 60th of a second. Once your camera goes below a 60th of a second, it is very hard to hand hold. Camera shake is one of the biggest killers of your pictures. So you want to have a high enough ISO where you have a shutter speed that can prevent camera shake. So it's up to you to monitor the numbers that are in your viewfinder. You have to be a responsible photographer just like you have to be a responsible driver. 
You know, you have a speedometer, and if you go above a certain number on that speedometer, you're going to get a ticket. Well, in photography, when you go below a certain number, your ticket is a blurry picture. That's the penalty. So you have to be responsible photographers. So for me, whenever I see my, highest, my shutter speed getting close to a 60th of a second or maybe a 50th or a 40th, I increase my ISO. And the ISO, 100 ISO goes to 200 ISO. That is the same as going from a 30th of a second to a 60th of a second. Whole ISO numbers equal whole shutter speed changes or whole aperture changes. The engineers who invented all this stuff made sure that when you go from 100 to 200, it's equivalent to changing your shutter speed by one shutter speed or changing your aperture by one whole f-stop. They're all equal. So if we went from here indoors, that's when you crank up your ISO really high. 1600, 3200, 6400. Whatever it takes to get above a 60th of a second. Doesn't that increase like, uh, you, you can come back, I had an issue a while ago, I was shooting and uh, I increased my ISO and I had a lot of green in the shot. The pixelation happens whenever you re raise your ISO. You have both a problem with what's called pixelation and color noise. You'll, you'll have an introduction of little red and green dots in your image. Well, in JPEG mode, we can put noise reduction into our menus. You look in here, and it's usually it's called NR, noise reduction, and you can dial in noise reduction. If you shoot in RAW, you can go in post-production in Lightroom, Aperture, whatever, Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, and you can take it out. There are algorithm sliders that allow us to remove the color and also to smooth out the pixelation, the grain, that, that grittiness to your picture. But out here in, 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 in winter, a day like today, you really don't have to worry about that. White balance. How do, do we find color? When I put this out here, we look at that black, David, now see that the snow is blue? So this blue snow will throw off your meter, your color meter in your camera. If you photograph with a lot of snow on white balance, on auto white balance, the camera will say this scene has too much blue, it'll warm it up to try to make the snow white again. But you want to make, you may want to capture that blue because it tells us we're cold. So why get rid of the blue? So understanding your white balance on your camera, again, that's why I'm trying to get you off of automatic. When you're in program mode, you can now hit the white balance button of your camera and be like an engineer. Take this scene on auto white balance, daylight, fluorescent, tungsten, flash, whatever your camera can do, I highly recommend shooting the same scene over and over and over again by changing your white balance. And that will educate your mind in understanding what color it really is. You know, what defines that red? What defines that green? It's about the light reflecting off of it. And if the light is biased by this overcast sky, this red will appear differently on your camera than on a sunny day. 
So again, by liberating yourself away from automatic, by simply going to P for program, allows you to experiment with various ISOs and experiment with various white balances. There's nothing special that uh, you know, a Vanity Fair photographer is doing, doing a portrait on location than you and I are doing out here. No difference. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Great. Oh, you're very Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Great. Okay.